YouTube, how we doing? Today, we're going to do part two of our takes on the best and worst picks in each round of your Dynasty startup draft. We did picks one through three in our last video. We are going to do rounds four, five, and six. In this video, we're also going to add an honorable mention in each round to someone who we like, they're interesting, and someone we're maybe a little off of in each round to give you a mini primer into the targets and fades in your dynasty startup. Joining me today is Phil Ruskin, my my good, good buddy who started this whole journey on YouTube with me, uh, honestly, just a couple weeks ago of The Extra Point, which you should absolutely check out. His show is live every Thursday. Phil, how are we doing? Doing great, man. I uh, appreciate you having me on. Always a good time to talk with you and, and enjoy being part of the Fantasy Football Tavern. Um, yeah, like Kendall said, you can find me at The Extra Point. Uh, I do a live show on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific. Check out the YouTube channel. I'm also on Spotify uh, and Patreon. So you just go and find The Extra Point. If you are more of a podcast person and don't have time to join the live stream, uh, jump on and it'll be the same content. Obviously, want to make sure we're getting you the best content we possibly can. But stoked to be uh, doing rounds four, five, six. I think there's a lot of value in these rounds, a lot of good takes, and certainly a lot of players we're going to get into tonight. So yeah, man, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So we did rounds one through three. The idea with one through three is better players, meaning if you're off or on by a few percentage points, it's a big deal. But ADPs are condensed. It's harder to be wrong, harder to be right. You're only picking between a very small range. You might be looking two ahead, two behind. When you start getting four, five, and six, you can start reaching more. You can start getting a little bit crazy, and it's not crazy, and uh, it's 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 why we play fantasy. So I'm looking forward to it. Also, quick mention check out our good friends over at the get right fantasy network For we sure. do mock drafts with them monday and friday friday night super good time uh it's it's really good it's competitive mock drafts if you're not looking to you know join like a mock draft live stream or anything but you just want to mock draft with competitive people come and hang in our community there there are people i was working today there was three or four people that were joining uh, and trying to add me to mock drafts like during the middle of the day so if you just are a nut that loves mock draft we have an awesome community so come Come join, come check us out and get right fantasy network and definitely check out me and Phil's channels for more content. Let's dive into what you came in here for. So round four, starting in round four, if you haven't seen rounds one through three, check out the video. Um, I will kick us off. My favorite pick in round four, my best pick is going to be Devin HN. He's a player. I started the season maybe a little bit down on. And as I thought about him and theory crafted him a little bit more and more, I've kind of resulted in this take. He's really a mini Christian McCaffrey. He can take any touch to the house. He's a competent pass catcher. He's faster than everyone on the field. And he needs about 10 to 12 touches to get you like 30, you know, 30 fantasy points. I love that. In a league that keeps going more and more running back by committee, lowering the, the snap count and the touch count, I want explosive players at running back. The bell cow might be going away. I want bell cows, but they're hard to get. You can't get them anywhere. And if I can get someone who produce it, out produces bell cows in the fourth round and is young and is on a good offense, right? And is game script prone because when they're leading, he can still take one touch to the house. If they're yep. from behind, he can catch passes. I'm just liking a lot of his game. And the one bit of news we heard from him is that he put on a little bit of weight trying to gain some durability. I'm always going to like that. I think he's discounted at 410. His upside is amongst the top three. His downside isn't that much farther down the board, though. So I like his range of outcomes. And I'm saying Devin HN, maybe a newcomer to the fourth round. I thought he was earlier, but I'm loving him. Loving him in the fourth. My honorable mention, new segment we're starting, just to give you an idea of one other player we're kind of high on, a little wink their direction to say, hey, if you draft him, good on you, mate. Jalen Waddle. Same offense. I like the contract security. I like that in case of an injury, he has top 10, if not probably top five upside. We've seen it before. He has the combination of a pretty high floor, fantastic ceiling in a target condensed offense. I I like Waddle a lot. Who is uh, Phil? Who are you thinking? Best pick. Yeah, I mean, first of all, great takes. I think both of those guys are going to be really, really good this season. Um, for me, and obviously I'm in on both of those players, but I think for me, Saquon Barkley stands out here coming off the board as the overall mm -hmm. RB7. 
look, it's it's the best situation he's ever been in, right? And I think you just mentioned it, talking about the league starting to transition more to these running back by committee, or at least a two headed, you know, committee, um, the one two punch, if you will. And and Saquon Barkley's, you know, competition is Jalen Hurts, right? There isn't another running back that's going to be taking touches from him. So while he might, um, you know, lose a couple of touchdowns this season to, you know, the running quarterback in this case, like I, we'll talk about the tush push and what that looks like with Jason Kelsey's retirement. But this is the best offensive line he's ever been behind. Kellen Moore is coming in as an, you know, a, 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 I believe a really good play caller and he's got an opportunity to take over a really explosive offense. Combine that with the fact that Barkley is a good pass catcher. He's going to get the obvious, you know, um, ru rushing yardage that we expect from him. To me, I think he has a, a floor of RB5, but this is, again, a player that we know can be the overall RB1 in, in fantasy. So if I can get Saquon as my RB1 in the fourth round and start with a hero QB, you know, one of the top quarterbacks or, you know, add in two, two top receivers, I'm thrilled by that. Um, I also think at the end of the day, you, you're going to see Saquon score. He's going to score touchdowns. And I know I just mentioned, you know, Jalen Hurts might take some away from him, but New York wasn't scoring the volume of points that we expect Philadelphia to score. Um, I think the other thing people forget is the Eagles started so well last year and that the second half of the season was so poor. We're not down on any of their individual pieces from a fantasy perspective because we, we certainly know the talent that they have. But I think the Eagles have something to prove this year to say, hey, look, you know, we kind of got embarrassed sorry bucks fans but kind of got embarrassed in that you know that playoff game by the buccaneers they're they're back with a vengeance i think they believe they're a super bowl team and ultimately the pieces we want pieces of that offense so i think saquon as the rb7 here is is a great value at the uh kind of honorable mention spot it's nico you know similar to your jalen waddle take nico just secured the bag three-year contract um, he proved last year he can certainly be an alpha in this offense. CJ Stroud had an incredible rookie season. We expect CJ Stroud and honestly other pieces of the Houston offense to take that second, third year, depending on how old they are, you know, kind of leap in the NFL. Diggs's contract was voided. I, I believe Diggs is playing for a contract. We've seen him force his way out of two other situations, good situations in Minnesota and in Buffalo. So you know, the age of Diggs, the 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 prima donna attitude to me, I think Nico's the alpha in this offense. I think he's the wide receiver one. Um, Tank obviously is a very different type of a player, so I don't see a world where the two of them are competing for the same targets. I think Nico outperforms Stefan Diggs and ultimately rises to be the, the wide receiver one in this offense as the X receiver. And to me, if I like I said earlier, if I can start with a you know one of the big quarterbacks and two top receivers to get Nico Collins as my wide receiver too. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with that. You know, looking at my team and my first four picks, I'd be very comfortable with that build. I'm excited by that. Sometimes it's as simple as good players on good teams, right? So that's what we're after, right? Ceiling performances, good players on good teams. I mean, nobody wants to pick a bad player on a good team and vice versa, a bad player on a bad team. So yeah, let's, let's go get ceiling performances from guys that we want to root for. That's the key. Look, I think a mini lesson break here. If you are a person that constantly thinks about how they can mess a pick up versus how they can get it right, if you are more troubled by how wrong you can be versus how right you can be, the best way to just be a winning player is good players on good teams, followed by decent players on good teams. And I think Just, as fantasy managers, we're constantly overthinking, we're constantly overanalyzing. And, you know, if you didn't check out the video that Kendall and I did on rounds one through three, we were splitting hairs because we're talking about the top 36 guys. They're pretty much all good players, right? So it's like now we're getting to that point of the draft where we can start to find a little bit of pockets of value. And that's why I'm excited for this show tonight is we can really dive a little bit deeper into some of the guys that could finish inside that top 24. And that's what we're looking for. So, yep. Yep. I, I like it. And we're talking about what well, there's like tiebreakers here too, right? Nico versus someone else you like for legitimate reasons. Yeah. Nico's got a contract. Hey, what's their contract situation looking like? Is there a hidden downside that's kind of there that you should think about where there's isn't for some other players? Just something to think about, right? Keeping track of where the money goes me means something, right? And I think our honorable mentions definitely uh, show through that. And that's, that's a, it's a level up in dynasty and trying to keep track of contracts and players. A lot of times I would follow content to kind of keep abreast with that sort of things. Um, but yeah, that's, it's also why I like Nico quite a bit too. I mean, great point. It's just good offense, good contract. 
a lot of good things for a lot of years. I mean, uh, you you're going to be right more often than you're wrong because of the environment. So contracts matter. Could not agree more. Yeah, I would take his contract. <laughs> I'm not um, as yeah. good as him at a- anything, but um, yeah. And maybe one day you guys will, will say we're, we're, we're good at fantasy football, I hope. <laughs> but uh, I would take that contract. Let's uh, let's hate on some people, shall we? Everyone's like, yeah, right. we know the good players. All right, we all know the good players. Who am I fading and why? Um, round four is the easiest on the planet for me. In fact, I'm going to let you take it because you might actually hate this pick more than I do, and that's tough. Um, but uh, Deshaun Watson is a tire fire of a pick, and I wouldn't I wouldn't do it. Tire fire of potentially a human being, but I get unsubstantiated, so I guess I will save that for another day. My worth mentioning before I let you just – just fully legally slander this man. <laughs> um, Travis Etienne, a little bit low on my board in the fourth. Okay. My very simple one layer take is he's, he's good, not great or great, but definitely not elite. He is getting older in an offense that actively would love to use him less. And a team that hasn't won enough games, giving him the rock on every play. I think the range of outcomes is steadily going down very predictively for Travis Etienne. This is probably his last season of like not significance. He's too good for that, but he's not going to get any better. And he's already at a place where people don't love it. So if you have other options, I'm fading Etienne when and where I can, unless he's a value. Now, Phil, take it away, my friend. Yeah. I mean, look, I I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because I just think folks probably understand Deshaun Watson's not a great value in the fourth round. I don't care if it's super flex. And if you've tuned into any of my content, then you've heard me say this before. If this is the first time you've, you've really heard, you know, any of my takes, I won a championship last year, Anthony Richardson and Jordan love are my quarterbacks. I lost Richardson in week four. I had Russell Wilson and in championship week in week 17, Sean Payton benched Russell Wilson. So I started Jarrett Stidham with Jordan love. Now the rest of my team, my core is really good, obviously. Otherwise I wouldn't have been in the championship game. But my point is, is that everyone in Superflex pushes these quarterbacks up the board and Kendall at the top of the show, you mentioned that, you know, we're in a couple of live drafts right now. We're in a draft right now where I firmly believe. And if the folks in that, you know, draft are listening, I hope they are. The quarterbacks have been overdrafted because people panic in Superflex. Oh, oh, I have to, I have to get this second quarterback. You don't. It's nice to have it. But what you're talking about are guys that that probably point wise aren't going to outscore. They're not going to outscore some of the top wide receivers in the league. And to me, Deshaun Watson, yes, he missed most of last year. And obviously the year before was coming off of, I think it was like 18 months of not playing. But we're still talking about a player that was averaging about 15 fantasy points, 16 fantasy points a game. Right. Like the the performance hasn't been there. The Browns are stuck with him for two more years. We just talked about contracts and why they matter. It's not just that contracts matter. It's how much money is invested in those contracts. And I think at the end of the day, when you look at the breakdown of Deshaun Watson's contract, it would be the most expensive dead cap loss outside of the Russell Wilson deal. And I think the entire NFL world is talking about how the Russell Wilson cutting of Russell Wilson by the Broncos may go down as the worst contract in NFL history. I believe the Deshaun Watson contract is actually worse. Um, The Browns certainly haven't gotten to where they thought they would be with him. Um, And at the end of the day, his performance, the morality piece is why he's not on my team. But even if he was the best human on the planet, the football performance hasn't been there. So that's why I don't want him on my team. I would much rather, I know Brock Purdy, you can see is off the board here in the third round, but I would rather take one of the rookies there than Deshaun Watson. You know, JJ McCarthy is not in this, in this, uh, in this view at all. I would take a shot on McCarthy in the seventh or eighth round as my QB two. And I would go grab Trey McBride. I would grab Devonta Smith. I would grab a lot of these guys you see on the board from a skill position perspective in rounds four. Uh, sorry, excuse me. That are guys that are going in rounds five and six in round four and build my roster out that way. I would just feel more comfortable um, with a better you know, depth at a wide receiver position or running back position or grab one of the alpha tight ends uh, over you know, reaching. And I believe it is a reach to grab Deshaun Watson in the fourth. I could not agree more. I don't have the stats in front of me, but trust the fact that I spend more time on fantasy than basically anything else. DJ Moore, Pacheco, um, Tank Dell, and Diego Samuel, and Kelsey 
all have had stretches of, I think, at least three consecutive games where they would have outscored three consecutive games of Deshaun Watson. Right. right. Um, and it just that shouldn't happen in this particular. I just think he's a little early. Like, I, I think late fifth, early sixth is fine. I still don't love him, but he's simply going over players that will outscore him at, at quarterback. And if he doesn't bounce back, it's a bad pick. It's like we both hate picks that are like they need to outperform reasonable expectations in order to gain value. And he's getting the bump because he's a quarterback, not because he earned it. Um, and it's been a long time. We There's a lot of players we didn't start drafting at high capital after kind of a, a pretty significant uh, incident. So, yeah, I agree with you there. Let's uh, let's move on. Round five. Let's get into some interesting stuff here. Uh, my favorite pick in round five based on this ADP set. Every draft is different, but in this ADP set, which I, I, I believe is is it's pretty accurate for competitive drafters. Dynasty League Fantasy is uh they're they're a, they're a great yeah, company, sharp, great sharp. stuff, and they draft with some sharp people. I'm gonna go with Zay Flowers. I've been rising on Zay Flowers. He's the wide receiver one on his team. Now I get it, Mark Andrews may be the receiving best option, but I think it's important to know that when you start getting into the fifth plus round you're kind of outside a wide receiver one range and flowers is still the wide receiver one on his team. That is still a good offense wins a lot of games. Um, so I'm, I'm liking him quite a bit. One. I like the fact that in a PPR league, he gets a lot of screens. So he still has kind of a nice safe floor in terms of he's going to have an elevated target share with all those screens. He can do things with those screens. The fact that the other team has to respect the box has to respect by the way, they had a million running backs that were kind of so-so last year. Um, obviously, the Gus bus ended up taking it home for them. Derrick Henry is a big upgrade to the Gus bus. You have a light box. Massive. You're going to get punished by two of the league's best running backs. Zay Flowers is in a situation where he is going to have a, a, a paper airplane guarding him sometimes. Um, and I think he is going to have huge efficiency numbers because of it. I think he's going to have more broken plays because of the additional weapons or the, the weapon, I guess you could say. Uh, and I already liked his game last year. This was an offense that I should say this, this was a team that the defense did big work still will do good work again, but I don't think Zay was like super called upon was super needed. He didn't get a bunch of elevated point totals when Andrews went down. He was actually pretty similar when Andrews was down and when Andrews was up. This is a, a wide receiver that benefited when the offense was good and when the offense was bad. When the offense was good, he scored. When it wasn't, he wasn't. And that's pretty indicative of a lot of, of, of running backs, honestly. We're talking about a wide receiver. But the point is, we're talking about a wide receiver one on a good team in the fifth round that is young and extremely talented and I think goes a little bit under the radar because he's not the pass catcher one. But the fact that, I mean, Andrews is not old, but he can still get used differently than Mark Andrews can in those screen games. And he can do pretty insane things. And I, I see no reason why the offense should go away from something that was working. I just like him. He still has additional room to grow on upside. He can't really go much further down safe floor, high ceiling. Gotta love it. He's one of my favorite picks in round five. Yeah. My honorable mention, I'm going to make it quick is actually in round six and doesn't belong there. It makes no sense in my <laughs> drafts. He's in the fifth round all day, every day. And honestly, early fifth, if that, and I don't understand why Dalton Kincaid is not in the fifth round. He's one of my favorite options. He would be right neck and neck with Zay flowers, potentially above him in some scoring formats. I love Dalton Kincaid. I don't know why he's in the sixth round here. I do see him fall from some of the others and I don't know why, but uh, Kincaid, well, we're going to, we're going to get to him. We're going to get to him here in the sixth. Spoiler oh, we might. alert. We Spoiler might get to alert. him a little bit. Um, right. For me, cool. it's, for me, it's Debo. And, and I think there's, there's a lot of unknowns right now about Brandon. Ayuk. you know, if you saw the social media video this week of him FaceTiming Jaden Daniels saying they don't want me, bro. Like I don't want to go down a social media path, but <laughs> I probably wouldn't have put that content out, but I, I get the gamesmanship from Ayuk. Um, look, I think I think for me, it's it's the simple fact of what Debo means to San Francisco, right? And we just talked in the last round, find good players on good teams. We love San Francisco's offense. We know they're going to be a winning team. We know they're going to be a high scoring team. And you want pieces of that. And Christian McCaffrey is going to go in the first or second round, no matter what happens, no matter what your format is. And that's fine. 
But outside of that, we still want the pass catchers on this team. Christian McCaffrey is a dual threat running back. He is a wide receiver and a running back in one player. Debo is like Christian McCaffrey light in that sense of we saw him take um, snaps out of the backfield. We've seen him get rushing touchdowns. Now, when Christian's healthy, when George is healthy, like, sure, that volume may not be there the way it was before they had Christian McCaffrey in that season where Debo was kind of their running back one. But we've seen it happen. And my point is, is that Shanahan's not afraid to go to his playbook when he needs to get a play or needs to get a touchdown in the red zone and call something that is Debo's number. He's the yak monster. He can go and just I mean, that's what he's built his career off of. He's an incredibly difficult player to tackle in the open field. I think if Ayuk does go. Debo's value is still important to the offense simply because of how they use him. But if I goes and that vacated target share is there, I'm a big Ricky Pearsall guy. We're not going to talk about him tonight. Debo's value and George Kittle's value really, really increases. And I think they're probably in rounds four, potentially, potentially late round three, if someone really believes in them that much. The reason I think he's a value, the last kind of quick point on this, the reason I think he's a value is if you look at the players in this round, Debo's going at the 512 here. I see the path where he outscores Higgins. I absolutely see the path where, path where he outscores Pickens. I see a path where he outscores a lot of these guys, and he's going later than them. So we're talking about ceiling performances. Sure, the challenge with San Francisco is you don't know whose week it's going to be. But when it's a Debo week, it's it's going to be big rewards. Um, I know this isn't best ball, but like grab shares of Debo Samuel and best ball, man. Just do it. Um, but I still think of a dynasty perspective. Yes, he's a little older, but from a dynasty perspective for two to three years, Debo is going to have a lot of value, especially if Ayuk leaves and he remains in San Francisco. Um, my honorable mention is, is Devonta Smith. And I kind of feel like it's the Eagles variety hour right now. Like I'm not trying to make this an Eagles show, but at the end of the day, good player, good offense, just got a contract. Look, I don't want to speak it into existence, but if Devonta Smith suddenly becomes the wide receiver one in Philadelphia for any reason, that's fantastic. What I do love about Devonta Smith is that even though he is the second option in this offense, and I just talked about the, the, uh, the value of Saquon Barkley ahead of him, we've seen Jalen Hurts support Devonta Smith and A.J. Brown in the same season as a wide receiver one for fantasy, similar to your take on Jalen Waddle. We've seen to a support Tyreek and Jalen Waddle both to top 12 seasons. So I don't care if Devonta Smith is the wide receiver too. I've seen him do it. I believe he can do it again. And honestly, if he doesn't finish as a wide receiver one, he's a wide receiver two floor. I, in the fifth round, knowing that if you look at team two, let's just assume that that was my team. I wouldn't obviously take Watson. But if I start with Puka and Tyree Kill and I can get Devonta Smith as my wide receiver three, pop probably playing as a flex, who I know has a wide receiver two fantasy finish within his range of outcomes and expectations, that's tremendous value. That's too hard for me. I'm clicking the button as probably as fast as I can. Love it. Honestly, I'll 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 throw this out at you. I didn't pick Devonta Smith as my favorite player only because, and he would have been absolutely. I actually think it's kind of unrealistic. He will finish the ADP season out in the fifth round. I am seeing him consistently at like the three, four turn or the yeah. early four. Yeah. So I think this is a situation where everyone above him, he didn't fall. Everyone else rose and he was just kind of a static casualty. If that makes sense, right? It was not his fault. All he did was get paid. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. you know, but but I get it. Quarterbacks are moving up. The more what I find, the more real drafts that happen in mock drafts, quarterbacks go late because you're trying to push the envelope of how much positional value you can get while still being OK at quarterback. You test that out in mock so you can figure out when you're screwed and when you're not. And what do you do when you're screwed? That's what mocks are for. How do you bail yourself out of getting boxed out of your QB three? How do you save yourself from getting boxed out of, oh, I went hero RB, or I, I didn't go hero RB, I went zero RB, and now there's nothing. Right. You try to figure out how what's my way out of a bad situation. But when real money is on the line, it's your draft. It's not so much real money, it's real feelings and emotions and fun. We do this for fun. Not all of us are professional sports gamblers, right? Although we like to be. We still want to enjoy the process. And sometimes second and third place still feels good. You want to compete, right? In those moments, that's why in real drafts, quarterbacks go just a little bit earlier than they would. And if it's this player, but I could wheel them, 
No, no. In, in real money, you're just taking what you need for the most part. And so I, I feel like with that, that's why some of those quarterbacks, because these are based on mock drafts, have him falling to that level because people are taking other shots. Um, but I do think Devonta Smith, that's probably the latest he's going to go. I think he goes a little bit earlier. Just a quick aside, if you, you shouldn't consistently count on him in the fifth. I would count on him in the late fourth. I also still think if we're talking about him and as a, as a value in the fifth, is he a value in the fourth? I'm not sure, but I'll tell I'll say this. I still like him in the fourth, right? I, I don't yep. love him yep. more than Nico, more than Waddle. So I'll just throw that out for, for what it's worth. I agree. He's still a good pick in the fourth. And, and keep in mind as you, as you know, as you and I get into the sixth round here, it's June. You're going to see guys rise. You're going to see guys fall. We haven't got into training camp yet. We don't have the, you know, we've got some of the mini camp hype videos and guys making one handed catches. It's like the combine though. You know what I mean? Guys are running around in shorts. We don't have pads on. It's not, you know, two weeks until football starts. So I think you're right. I think Devontas, I think a handful of the guys we've talked about tonight will probably be pushed around higher. I could absolutely see that happening. No one's injured yet. We know that that happens, right? Joe Burrow last season started with the calf injury. And, you know, so we know things are going to to change uh, between now and August slash September when you're doing your real drafts. But to be fair, dynasty drafts are happening right now. So these are the times I think if you're doing a dynasty draft this early, you can snag some of these values where in a redraft league, you're right. You're probably having to pay a, a third or fourth round for Devonta Smith for sure. Moving on. Uh, so I'm... Uh let's 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 jump into it so <laughs> <laughs> let's just get into it uh my worst okay yeah. Well, so, yeah, we know it's coming it's really some fun okay i don't love debo samuel in the fifth and throw it out there now me and phil play a lot of fantasy together um we like to steal well we haven't stolen a title from each other yet actually we just started playing together in leagues this year but we're already uh, arch nemesis in many of them i'll say on debo we agree that Debo is one of the best, best ball picks. I love him in redraft. I'll tell you what, I don't hate him in dynasty, but I hate him for the way I play dynasty. The way Phil plays Debo can make a little bit more sense. But let me try to walk you through why Phil has him as a value. And I have him as one of my least favorite picks because one of us has to be wrong, right? I know for well, yeah, wrong. sure. I mean, Phil's usually <laughs> wrong and I'm usually right. No, no that's, that's, that's not the case. Okay. The way that I build my teams, I typically, I like cashing in on the, when I go young, the next year I get free points because people age out and they also tear out with their age. And I don't need my team to appreciate so much as just stay where they are and everyone else gets worse and I get to value for free. It's free value. I don't mind sometimes giving up a year of contention for that. It does have an actual cost to it. It's a whole buy-in to basically not compete, right? Debo for me is a guy I love, but I love to trade for him when I know I'm in my window. In a startup specifically is when I'm hesitant about Debo. Because with a lot more rounds to go, I'm not sure... Maybe you're at the turn. He's going at the 512 here. What do we know about the turn? The turn typically means you're having to reach for your guys pretty consistently. It's just the nature of being at the turn. Sometimes you have to solve a position before it gets cut, and so you have to reach. And sometimes you have to do that multiple times. And when you do that multiple times, you know, you're you're you can kind of put yourself in a little bit of a pickle where the draft comes to you, you don't come to the draft. Where in the middle, you can just kind of be the value person that just takes the value as it comes to you. You're a little more flexible, a little more pivotable. And so with a guy like Debo, I just don't love taking someone uh, at the tail end of the fifth that boxes me a little bit into a team that's a little bit more like in their win now window, like over the next three years, like this year, next year, and the next year, it's very condensed. You're not as able to be as water. You know, he's he's good and you can also get trade value for him. So I like Debo. He's just this in between piece where I tend to draft younger and he'll be the old guy on my roster. And so from that sense, he won't align. And he also forces you if you're to draft a good team properly with Debo Samuel, it probably should include some aging veterans that you can get at a value for their production. And it makes a lot of sense just a little too rich for me 
I don't really know where my draft's going to go. My first four picks in most cases are going to set me up in any scenario, but I'm probably third and fourth are going to lean young. And if they do Debo's bad now in the third round, right? If I go with Jonathan Taylor, perhaps right in the fourth round, I go with maybe Ayuk or Pittman. Debo starts to make a lot of sense in terms of a, uh, I'm starting to draft a lot of points guaranteed points right now. And you can start to work yourself into a pretty elite team. That's where he makes sense. He's on my list of the worst pick in round five because he's extremely build dependent. And I am rating him on the percentage of builds where he just doesn't fit or when he doesn't fit, he's a draft to trade. He just, just does nothing for your team when he's on the wrong team. He does a lot for your team when he's on the right team. Hope that makes sense. I like Debo. I don't like him in Dynasty in particular in startups, right? Um, If you're an existing Dynasty team, I don't think I can put a better buy low, buy now window player than Debo. You better get him quick, though, because if if Ayuk really leaves, you won't be able to buy him for what you can get him today. And I think that's that window's closing. I think there's enough fear that Ayuk is going to leave that Debo and George Kittle's value to buy what you could go, what you could have got them for last month. It, it's closing. It's closing quick. I'll tell you, the IU owner is scared about him not leaving. Correct. Because Debo is the single most valuable asset on that team when he's there. Well, I can, you, and I, you and I have talked about this and not on this show tonight, but I want to bring it up because we've talked about this a bunch. I said a long time ago that I thought one of I when they drafted Pearsall, I said one of Ayuk or Debo will wind up in Washington because of Kyle Shanahan's relationship to that organization. It's it's not going to depend on it's not going to keep the Niners from a Super Bowl. Sorry, Commanders fans, you're not close. And by the time you are, if especially if it's Debo because he's a little older than Ayuk, they'll be gone. It won't be the value there. So to me, you know, I I, I hope they keep him because I'm a Niners fan. But at the end of the day, I think. I think one of them's going. It may not be Washington, but I think one of them's going to go. Uh, and right now, it's certainly the news. If you if you you know are tuned in, and if you're watching this show, you're tuned in. Ayuk seems to be the odd man out. And I thought I thought once those contracts started to go for Jefferson, CD's contract hasn't gotten done yet. But Amon Ra's contract, you know, resetting the market before JJ's contract. I mean, read the room, Brandon Ayuk. You're a good player, man, but you haven't done what those guys have done. You shouldn't expect that kind of money. I know you want it, and I know that's what you need to take care of your family and you know the career that you've had. And I do think Ayuk is a very valuable receiver, and he does deserve to get paid, but not top of the market like a Justin Jefferson, like an Amon Ra, and like the contract we expect C.D. Lamb's going to get here, uh, and Jamar Chase You know, over the next couple of weeks, maybe the next couple of months before the season starts. So, um, Am I up? Are we doing round six? Are we uh, no uh, five? I need a worst value in the fifth. Um, mine's simple. It's Bryce Young. You know, I I'm kind of taking uh, the approach in this worst picks with Deshaun Watson in the fourth and Young in the fifth. Look, I don't know what Bryce Young is. No one does. And we have you know a a, a play caller with Dave Canales coming in as a head coach, and we we like what he did. He's he's got a good track record with quarterbacks. He's had success there. Um, I think Tampa had. I think Tampa had a really good season, largely due to Dave Canales last season. I I believe he is one of the major reasons why they were, you know, look, their division was poor, but they won a playoff game in a in a big way over the Eagles um, and competed, you know, in that next game uh, as well. So to me, it's I believe in Canales. Um, I just don't know what Bryce Young's ceiling is. He's not a guy that I have a lot of exposure to anywhere, especially in Dynasty. Um, and I will share this, and then I think it's it's probably time to move on. But I took over an orphan team this season. I put Bryce Young. I had uh, that orphan team that I took over had Lamar Jackson and Anthony Richardson at quarterback. I put Bryce Young on the trade block because he was the third quarterback on that roster. Honestly, I didn't expect to get any offers for him, and I probably would have taken like just the best offer I could have. I got the 108. I ended up taking J.J. McCarthy to replace him. I was shocked I got a first round offer. I clicked the button immediately and I was on the clock. That orphan roster I took over had two firsts. So I was able to grab Romo Dunze and then I was able to come back and basically upgrade, in my opinion, upgrade Bryce Young into JJ McCarthy. And JJ McCarthy has his flaws. We know that. But to me, 
I kind of say to myself, and I think you should if you're a Bryce Young manager or if you're considering, you know, trading for or away Bryce Young. I kind of liken him to the quarterbacks in this class and where would he be drafted if he was in this year's class? Because last season was so poor and it was such a throwaway season. Would you take him over McCarthy? Would you take him over Drake May? Because you're not taking him over Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams. So like that's the exercise I want to encourage folks who are listening to this show to go through is if you have a rookie who did not have a good season or was injured, Kendry Miller is a great example of this. I know we're not going to talk about him, but just he's a great example because he was injured for so long last season. Where would you take those players if they were in this year's rookie class in, or in, in this year's startup and they were a rookie? I think that's a good exercise for folks to go through. So I'm out on Bryce Young. Um, I'm okay being wrong if he has this big bounce back season. I don't see a QB one season. I don't see him as a top 12 guy. I just don't see that. So to me, I think there's better guys that I could find a QB two season from, and I'd rather somebody else take Bryce Young and I'll go and grab, you know, Isaiah Pacheco, Zay Flowers. You can see like the guys on the board. I'd rather go grab a skill position player there. Can't disagree with you. In fact, his running back at the six, three might outscore him for the next year or two and be the reason if they make the playoffs, it won't be because of Bryce. I think that's the challenging part with him is if the well, team Kendall. does good, he doesn't have to. Who's your round six <laughs> best player? <laughs> I was like, you know what, Phil? This is why I bring you on, man. You ask the tough <laughs> questions. You really make me dig deep. And you know what? It's a good I'm going to take a Carolina Panther. Jonathan Brooks, my goodness, I am rising so ridiculously high. I need someone to like check me a little bit. I have been rising on him week after week after week. I find myself in situations where I have to like, I've got like a group text with like the get right fantasy guys with Phil. And uh, I feel like I'm bringing up Jonathan Brooks a lot every day. I'm like, Hey, this player versus Brooks. I took this player. Brooks went after him. This guy's higher in my rankings. I want Brooks more. And he just keeps rising. I just, I love him. The, the, we talk about game scripts. What about like season and like team dynasty scripts, right? Like he is the Carolina Panthers. They're they're gonna have a receiving core of sorts with a quarterback that can maybe deliver the ball to them, but they're they're gonna have a steady Eddie. They're gonna have someone that can run the ball, catch the ball, run the ball some more, catch the ball some more. Reminds me so so much of someone taken in the same column at him as the at the four three. When Saquon Barkley joined the New York Giants. I see Jonathan Brooks in a different scenario, but I see very similar parallels, right? Now, sure, Brooks is not the prospect Barkley was. Right. I get that. Right. Fully understand, right? Barkley wasn't injured coming in. Totally get that. But you're talking about someone who walks in and is basically the identity of the team. You look at a, you look at 20 Panthers jerseys, with 10 of them are going to be Brooks. I, just, I see a guy who the team, they gave up picks to get him. They stole him from Dallas. They knew they did. Did they, they, or did Dallas just? <laughs> well, we could talk about Dallas, Dallas in a separate just meme episode, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we <laughs> I mean, I mean, we could, but let me just doing? line up some things, right? Gave up picks to get them. Know that they need an all-purpose weapon. They clearly need an all-purpose weapon. They need someone who can run the ball 30, not 20 times a game, 30 times. They would love to win the game uh, uh, in, in the same fashion that Michigan did. They would love to do that. Okay? And in... When they're losing, and by the way, they're probably going to lose a lot. Brooks can do the Ramondre and catch five passes in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I just point. I see upside in every phase of the game for him. I see upside in every situation. Every time something bad or good happens to the Panthers, it's not bad or good to Brooks. It's just good. He's just the guy that will get the ball handed to him because he is just the most talented person to be able to touch the ball play to play. It should be Bryce. Bryce does touch the ball every play, but he's not able to execute in that offense right now. And Brooks is going to help him do so. And I think the elevation of Brooks in that role player in that offense is going to speak to his career in Carolina. I think he's going to be a hallmark. Every fan is going to look forward to seeing Brooks do his thing. And until he gets traded, I think he is that offense. And I think in, we just talked about it in a, a league of, uh, of where we're looking at like, Hey, Devin A. Chan's going to touch the ball half the amount of times that Brooks does consistently, and he's going two rounds earlier, right? We value these high-efficiency explosive backs. 
Well, Brooks has the ability to do all those things. Had a you know a metric ton of touchdowns at Texas. Played under some of the like the current dynasty RB one. I mean, the pedigree is elite. What he learned from was elite. I, I have every reason to expect that Brooks he is a top ten running back now, and I have no reason to assume he doesn't jump immediately into the uh, Pacheco Cook Walker White tier and probably surpass them with his age if I'm being honest. So I think he immediately jumps into a late fourth, early fifth round pick next year with youth and continues to appreciate. I can't say enough good things about Brooks. Just draft him in the sixth. draft him in the late fifth. Honestly, you can't draft him too early. There's no mistake. Maybe late fourth is where I start saying mistake, but five, one, he's not even a mistake. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. Uh, Brooks is great. Worth mentioning just a tail end. I won't go into this. Quarterbacks are being pushed up the board. I particularly have two quarterbacks that end a tier for me. It's Bo Nix and Will Levis. Levis, short leash, risk, but great weapons, better O-line. His range of outcomes does favor him working versus not working. If it works, he's a smash. If it doesn't, he's going to get replaced, no question. But when it works, I think he he has real platitude there. Um, there's some things. Nix, longer, uh, longer leash, but, I mean, he is talented. He's got good coaching. The fact is, he's a highly drafted quarterback on an offense that has no draft picks. Uh, I, I think uh, I think he's going to be good there for a while. He doesn't need to be good. If he's just decent, he's going to pay off his draft capital by a country mile in, in Superflex. So I like Levis and Knicks in the sixth as quarterbacks. If you've really solidified your uh, positional players, just know this is about they're not coming back to you in a seventh. The point here is if you want your young quarterbacks, this is where it ends. Just know that. And I like those two. I feel who you like. Yeah. To me, there's, there's an obvious standout and it's, it's Dalton Kincaid here in the middle of the round. And, you know, I think when you take a look at Buffalo, look, Stefan Diggs, 29% target share last year, that's vacated that equated to 160 total targets. I think, and I've said this Kendall to you many times and I'll say it here on the show. I think that Dalton Kincaid and um, Cook are James Cook are the big winners in the Stefan Diggs trade away. I'm Making high on targets. Keon Coleman. I'll be honest. I I was similar to how you're rising on Brooks. I'm rising on Keon Coleman. He he wasn't my favorite prospect coming out. I I grew up in Gainesville, Florida. Go Gators. So I have a little bit of Florida State bias. Slick right, baby. But <laughs> but I will say that aside from the you know where he went to college that. There are some holes in the profile, but I do see the path where Coleman's going to be really impactful and really effective. He's a rookie. It's going to take time, right? There's a lot that has to go right for him to be what we hope he will become. I think it will be better for him in year two than it will be in year one. Kincaid was, I thought, a very valuable player for the Bills last season. Um, and to me, in the sixth round, it's it's a, I, it's a steal. Like I'm not generally, you know me and my brand, I'm generally a punt tight end drafter. But I am getting to a point now where if I can get one of the top, what I consider the top end tight ends, after I've built a solid core at wide receiver and then I have either a, a, a onesie position with the quarterback early, I'm okay now taking a, a tight end one earlier than I normally would have because I do believe that the scoring, especially in the NFL with the, with the offenses are now based around passing and scoring is up. Look, Sam Laporta was wide receiver, would have been wide receiver 15 last season. That's where he would have finished if he were a wide receiver points, uh, total points on the season. And he's going in the third round here. I, I don't think Laporta is the tight end one again this season. Um, I do think Kincaid, Mark Andrews, Laporta, McBride. I think you could have a conversation around all Kelsey still for this season, not in Dynasty. But I think you could have a conversation with all of those names of who can finish as the overall tight end one. I like Keon Coleman. I think he's going to be really good. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I trust that James Cook is going to get targets. I trust that Dalton Kincaid is going to get targets. Josh Allen's going to run. He's going to score rushing touchdowns. I think that hurts James Cook's ceiling. I don't think that hurts Dalton Kincaid because he could still be the red zone, and I expect him to be one of the red zone passing options when Allen doesn't rush. James Cook has scored four touchdowns in his rushing touchdowns in his entire NFL career. It's not a great metric. We expect that to increase, but Josh Allen's still the guy. So to me, Dalton Kincaid in the sixth round is 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 an incredible value. 
I'm drafting him just about everywhere that I can as my tight end one, knowing that I'm probably missing out on Laporta, McBride, Andrews earlier, even Pitts. I've seen Pitts go ahead of him. So yeah, give me Dalton Kincaid in the sixth, and I am very comfortable with a plug and play tight end on a weekly basis. I think would, you, would you take him in the fifth? Um, I would if I have a hero RB. If I have Bijan or Gibbs, you know, if I have a, a Brees, somebody like that, and I know I can get an RB two later, then yeah, I would. I think for me, I've already talked about you know potentially grabbing a a, a lower end, you know, lower tier QB two and super flex to go and solidify a higher ceiling skill position player. So yeah, I think if he's in the fifth and the value's right, um, I wouldn't take him over certain wide receivers. And I think that's where people make the mistake, right? Like to me, we talked about Laporta on the last show. And you look at team eight here on the board. Okay, start you started with Justin Jefferson. Fantastic. I'd rather have a lot of those wide receivers that went off the board before I would take Sam Laporta because you're drafting him at his oh, yeah. ceiling. He has to perform at that level and outperform those wide receivers in order for in order for you to get that return on that draft capital. So give me two or three wide receivers in the third and fourth round and I'll take Kincaid in the fifth. Yeah. I'd be stoked on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah, I can't agree more. You get, I see him at the six one. He's gone, but I see him in the fifth. He's and, also often gone. I think it's fair to say the bills offense is awesome, but we like Kincaid. We like Coleman. Just try to take one of them. You're not going to yeah, get both, get but I think that's the lesson is draft. Well, but if you miss on one, I am fine reaching on the other because the upside's pretty ridiculous. This is dynasty. They're both young. They're both on offenses with a great young quarterback. Um, uh, yeah, I, I like them both. You can't take them both. So try to get shares of one so you can get shares of the other. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so Or if you it. miss out on both, look whose name's not on the board here. Go take James Cook as a pass catching running back. We just talked about all those vacated targets. Yeah. If somehow you miss out on those guys, mm -hmm. go get James Cook as your RB2. Yes, the touchdowns aren't going to be there, but if you get a hero RB, a Bijan, you get a Barkley, someone that you know is going to put touchdowns in the in the in the mm -hmm. scoring column for you, I'm fine with that. Um can't understand I, Cook not being here, by the way. Straight I, I've seen Cook in the late fifth every time. I've I have never too. seen him leave the sixth. Now it's it's the first m half of the month of this, so this ADP might be a slightly smaller set than we're used to. We're just kind of going with it as we do because it's the only tool we have. But I agree, Cook normally goes after Kincaid, yep. but before the six six. So own the Bills. We like Cook. We like Kincaid. We like Coleman. You know, I think it honestly, it's usually Cook late fifth, Kincaid later fifth or early sixth and then Coleman early seventh. It's whatever round you're in target. One of these guys, they're great. Yeah. And I mean, look, I have cook ahead of Rashad white and KW three in my personal rankings. Um, I have, I have him just behind Pacheco. I have a Pacheco cook white in my rankings and then Ken and then Walker. Um, but we talked about it, you know, five, 10 minutes ago, Kincaid's going to be one of those risers. I think as this, as the, <laughs> excuse me, as the, um, off season starts to kind of build and camp hype starts to build and we get excited about guys. I think you're going to see Kincaid pushed up into the fifth round. Maybe somebody Col really Col reaches Coleman's in the great. fourth. Coleman's no, great. Yeah. Rookies don't have a huge snap share because they don't know anything yet. Kincaid's going to have a 75% snap share. And players Coleman's going to have a 50% plus. Coleman will be great. You love Coleman. I love Coleman. I do. But Coleman's going to have camp hype. That turns into Kincaid targets in week one and two and three and four. Those Coleman targets will take some time. Kincaid, it won't. It just but Kendall, won't there take was, time. There was people that loved Quentin Johnston last year. Loved him. Well, they were wrong. And, and that's what I mean. Like we, we draft everyone in Dynasty, everyone in any sort of redraft league, best ball. You draft these players because you're right. We draft these guys because they're going to be the next insert name they're going to be the next jamar chase they're going to be the next caleb williams is the next patrick mahomes we don't draft because we think these guys are going to be busts otherwise we wouldn't draft them but that's just the truth and we know that having played dynasty and having played fantasy for as many years as we have not every prospect is going to work out so yes we love keon coleman and we think he's going to be great and the target share is there and everything that we want to see says he's going to be a good player and what if he's not i mean I'm there's, still, there's, like, there's a reason that like Pickens at the 5'10 above Coleman at like the 7'5 or whatever is interesting. 
right? Because Coleman has more upside in a better offense and Pickens has yep. less upside in a worse offense. Yep. But we've seen we've Pickens seen in the NFL catch highlight passes from a shitty quarterback. And in that an offense matters. where he is the one, he is the alpha in that offense. Deontay we've, Johnson is gone. So. We, the, you know, the point is we've seen people come in and do great things. We've seen people come in and not. And at various yeah. stages, it matters to see it one time. And we haven't seen it with Coleman. And even when we do, we saw it with Kincaid for a week or two. Yeah. No one was going crazy, right? We all yep. thought Kincaid to the moon, kind of. He still had a snap share with the other tight end. He was getting 10 targets, not 10 catches, though. It wasn't through the moon. We were still reserved, yeah. right? And we still are to that extent. Kincaid is not for me. He's not a smash like Laporta and McBride are because the target share can go in a lot of different directions. He absolutely carries risk, and this could be a Mahomes offense. They could copy Mahomes and say, we're going to throw four to you, four to you, four to you, four to you. We're going to throw four into the stands. We're going <laughs> to kick four. That could be how the Bills run the offense. They have great. Khalil Shakir is nice. I like Curtis Samuel, both for rushing and passing. I like him a lot. I think they have a they've got a backup tight end. That's fine. I think Buffalo could spread the ball around a lot. I think Cook could get a lot of targets and a lot of carries and be ridiculous. Like Cook, if anything, because of how often the running back can touch the ball between catching and passing, could be insane. With the point I'm getting to is Kincaid does carry some element of risk. Right. And I think that's why he's lower than McBride specifically. McBride yep. is such a condensed, hyper targeted situation in all outcomes where it just makes sense to put McBride ahead of Kincaid, where it's easier to slot other people ahead of Kincaid. But Kincaid's upside is absolutely the same as Laporta's, if and not more. And that's why it's the value to me is because that risk that you're talking about, I agree with, but it's built into the price. I agree. Right. Like I'm building that in of, OK, in the sixth round, I'm probably have my first five picks. I have one quarterback for sure. I have a running back for sure. And the way that I like to build, I probably have two two wide receivers, maybe three. No, for sure. And often if you so, take your hero RB in round two or you can take your first like not hero RB, but like I have to do something oftentimes that comes in the round five window with that Pacheco white cook yeah. walker situation it often leaves the sixth round potentially free to make like a where do you want to go pick and if he's still there there's we're talking about multiple options right kincaid's one we talked about brooks and others right but yep if they're still there and you've drafted correctly it's a smash and so cross your fingers man <laughs> so who's the who's the guy in the six that worst pick not for you not someone that you're that jumps off the board is like oh man i i have to have him you know just because I mentioned Bo Nix and Will Levis, I'm going to go Baker Mayfield because I think he's significantly worse. He's older. He's worse. He has all the worst combinations. Quarterbacks are getting pushed up. Mayfield is just an example of what not to do in like, don't panic during your draft, but definitely don't panic in prep. Like I would rather have Levis and Nix so much over Mayfield. Like they don't belong in the same round. And then after that, like Mayfield's single season upside, which everything went right last season. If one or two things don't go right, check out yeah. my quarterbacks like buy low, sell high window. You'll see I break out a very in-depth example of all the things that could go right and wrong for Baker. And a lot of things went right. Very little went wrong. It should regress to the, the mean. And when it does, that team could implode in a year. Yeah. Right. I'm Evans could be done. Godwin could be done. If that's the case, if you're completely rebuilding and everything has to go, I don't want to be stuck with the bag in the sixth. I could just take Levis or Nix and have a runway if things work out. Okay. Levis could get replaced. Nix has two, three years. Baker, he's got the contract, but it doesn't necessarily mean he, he Baker could be walking into a Bryce Young situation next year or worse okay. and have less runway youth draft cap. Well, not draft capital, obviously, but you, you get what I'm saying, right? Yep. Mayfield is like, he's the weakest scenario of like oh i just have to take somebody like i would rather take a bridge quarterback that's probably going to produce much more ppg and trade him if i need to than take mayfield and be stuck with the bag i just i think he's too early there's there's great players here like mayfield in this draft goes above high-end rookies like worthy or high-end sophomores like addison for no reason uh and i think mayfield's the example of quarterbacks are getting pushed just make sense of it. I think Levis and Knicks make sense because their upside scenarios are legit. They, 
Baker's isn't. Yeah. So he's my antithesis to those two picks. I have some others, but we'll save them for another debate. Episode yeah, yeah. Coming up it. soon, but it. maybe maybe prequel it, man. What do you think is I, the uh, in your case uh, a little me, bit different than my worst? To me, it's it's hard to say because he's not a bad player, and I like the player, but I'm 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 not as high on Jordan Addison as I think the community is right now, and the reason I say that is because of McCarthy, and I know about however many minutes ago I just talked about McCarthy being a value as a QB two. I still think McCarthy's a value as a QB two because he's guaranteed to touch the ball every time. And similar to what we thought about Tua a couple of years ago, Tua could throw a five yard pass and Tyree Kill can run the other sixty, and there's your sixty five yard touchdown. McCarthy could throw a fifteen yard pass and JJ can do the rest of the work. Uh, Jefferson, J Jettis, right? Like <laughs> we got to be careful now with our JJs and our JJs. We got two on the same <laughs> squad. But but my point is this: Justin Jefferson is the alpha of alphas in that offense. Jordan Addison is a very good wide receiver. I like Jordan Addison. I was very high on him coming out last year in the rookie uh, drafts. I have shares of Jordan Addison. TJ Hawkinson will come back at some point. People are forgetting about TJ Hawkinson. He's like the forgotten man. I know this is a dynasty show, but just quick transition for 10 seconds. If you are in a best ball draft, go grab TJ Hawkinson. I'm getting him in like the 12th or 13th round as my tight end too. Oh, I love it Sing because, to for me. The sec- because for the second half of the year, when he's healthy and comes back, thank you very much. It's basically a free tight end. Jordan Addison. Sorry to come back to what we're talking a about. A good one. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's, and that's my point. Exactly what you just said. A good one, right? There are targets that have to be shared in this offense. Justin Jefferson is going to get his targets. We have never seen JJ McCarthy throw an NFL pass. We did not see him throw a lot of passes at Michigan. I still think he's going to be QB in the QB2 range. I think he has that as his ceiling. I just don't see a path where there's enough volume where Jordan Addison is a wide receiver too. I don't. I think with TJ Hawkinson coming back at some point, with Justin Jefferson being the alpha that he is, someone's targets have to go down. And I think the first half of this season, Addison will be fine because Hawkinson's not there. I just wonder... One, again, we just talked about it. We all project these rookies to be the next, you know, big thing. We all expect them. We draft them to be great. What if they're not good? What if JJ McCarthy isn't good? And that's a real concern, right? And I think Kendall, you and I've talked about this, and a lot of folks that we're real degenerates, so we're into the real thick weeds, <laughs> but maybe, maybe folks aren't this deep into it. The Vikings tried to draft Drake May. J.J. McCarthy was not the quarterback that they wanted. They tried very actively to move up with the Patriots in the draft process to go and get Drake May. So, you know, to me, the Giants inquired with the Patriots about Drake May. They did not want J.J. McCarthy, and then they drafted Malik Neighbors, and McCarthy was on the board. They could have easily taken him as Daniel Jones' successor. So I think the NFL is telling you with their actions, we we see Drake May as a better prospect. We wanted him on our teams. We weren't able to get him. Okay, we'll take McCarthy and we'll see what we do. And of course, you got to play the game. We're so stoked to have you. You're going to be a great Viking. And he could. He could be a good player. But someone has to suffer in this offense. And to me, I think it's Jordan Addison. I would, I'll be honest, and I've done it because we're in drafts. I've taken Keon Coleman over Addison. I've taken Lad mm-hmm. McConkey over Addison. And so even though Addison had a good season last year, he's only going into his sophomore year. Put him up against this year's rookies. Again, they haven't caught passes. They could bust. But projection-wise, people are sleeping. Nobody wants Justin Herbert right now. Everyone is sleeping on Justin Herbert because everyone assumes that they're going to throw the ball. But we just had Jim Coventry on um, the main show for Get Right Fantasy Network two weeks ago. He made a great point. I wrote it in my notebook because I wanted to bring it up. The Chargers can't run the ball yet. They don't have the offensive line to do it. They don't have the ability to run the ball yet. They just can't. And they're not good enough. So are they really going to be able to run the ball when they're losing and have to throw it? Justin Herbert's going to throw the ball this season. I think Lab McConkey could be a good player in that offense. We talked about Keon Coleman, right? There's other receivers that are out there that aren't on this board right now that I might take a shot or two on over Jordan Addison because I believe that Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson will probably be the main target earners in that offense. And you're asking McCarthy to do a lot that he has never done in an environment that he has never played in. So to me, I would rather take Addison in the late seventh, early eighth than taking him here in the sixth. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. He he suffers, right? Uh, Addison and Flowers 
is a comment I frequently uh, get from people in sleeper DMs. Like, how do you differentiate? For me, it's simple, right? One has Lamar, one doesn't, right? One flowers catches screen passes. Even from a rushing quarterback, you still throw screen passes. Addison doesn't. Addison doesn't have a built-in target share like some of these other guys do. So I do, I agree with you. One of your implicit takes, I think that makes a lot of sense is that uh, Addison can suffer worse and really has nothing to benefit from the quarterback situation, but could definitely hurt worse in the same way that rookie quarterbacks often are just first read only. Um, so it could be, it could be slim pickings. And if you're uh, a rookie quarterback, sure. you know, we always talk about the tight end being the quarterback's best friend, especially for rookie quarterbacks. Okay. TJ Hawkinson, great tight end, but TJ Hawkinson is not going to be there for what? Six games, eight games. We don't know yet. Right. My point is, is that who are you going to throw the ball to Jordan Addison or Justin Jefferson? Like if I'm a rookie quarterback, I am throwing it to Justin Jefferson. I don't care if he's double covered. Like Tri- triple coverage. Maybe no I would problem. throw to Addison if he's triple. No covered. problem. Hey, <laughs> watch this. <laughs> yeah. But my point is, is that if I need to make a play, I'm going to the guy that I know can make the play. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just, it's, I expect Jordan Addison to be a good receiver. I, honestly, man, it wouldn't shock me at all if he finishes as a wide receiver three. It just it's, wouldn't. It's simple range of outcomes. Do yeah, you agree? It's, Where it's, it, it, it's it, upside limited, downside expansive. It's just, it's a range of outcomes math problem. You don't have to hate Jordan Addison. To hate I like him. And that's what I'm saying. I like the player. I think the floor and the ceiling are both lower in this McCarthy led offense because of McCarthy and because of Jefferson and Hawkinson. Mm-hmm. So, yep. yeah, I think it's a big exercise to what we do. And I think how both of us view the game, we might view like target windows and specific player evaluations a little bit different. We have some different philosophy. We're very, very aligned. It's why we, we work so well together with content, but One of the things we're looking at is if we're to get it wrong and we do often, where do we get it more wrong than we get it more right? What's the range of outcomes? Because we're saying we're going to lose and we're going to get it wrong. We're going to lose the bet. If we're going to lose, how do we make sure we win more often than when we lose? How do we lose less than our competitors? Addison, I think, is an example of a situation of we like him. But we think we can be right more often than not because of that range of outcomes, right? Brooks, if you draft Brooks too early, he's my example of a player that you really can't draft too early because there's this window of like the range of outcomes are all so positive. It's to how right you are. You're more right when you can take them later in terms of overall profit or value. Addison is one where your profit is shortened. Your downside is unfortunately pretty exposed. And that's why we don't like him compared to other folks. Great analysis. Uh, love it. So that was um, that was rounds four, five, and six. Quick recap to you guys, just going off of some notes here. I know we didn't cover everybody, but we do have some notes just in case we didn't have time for it. In round four, I really like Devin HN. Phil really likes Saquon Barkley. Some honorable mentions, just to wink at and consider, Jalen Waddell and Nico Collins. We love their contracts and overall upsides and good offense. Deshaun Watson in round four is clearly our least favorite pick and probably our least favorite in round five, if I'm being so honest and not too bold. Um, Worth mentioning, uh, uh, Travis Etienne is kind of, I'm throwing a little bit of shade his way as well. Just beware. Round five, best values, Zay Flowers for me. Debo Samuel for Phil with our least favorites being for me. Unfortunately, it's a weird Debo double take. I don't love him, but Phil does. Uh, We both agree that Bryce Young is pretty abysmal in the fifth round. Worth mentioning, we like Kincaid. We like him as early uh, as, as the fifth. I mentioned him in the fifth because I would take him that high. Phil loves Devonta Smith in the fifth, and we also like him in the late fourth. We don't think he's going to get to the fifth very often. Round six. I love Brooks. Phil loves Dalton Kincaid, as we both do. So, so good. Honorable mention, the quarterbacks, Bo Nix and Will Levis. Quarterbacks are getting pushed. Maybe not so wisely. I'm not advocating for a quarterback in round six, but if you need or have to or want to, those are two of my favorites, if you have to. Uh, People are fading. Uh, I'm not super big on Baker Mayfield if you're going to take a quarterback. 
big tear break for me between those guys. And Phil, not loving Jordan Addison. A lot of downside, very little upside. Worth mentioning, I'm not super big on Rashad White in the sixth. I think huge tear break below the other guys. Just not my favorite. A lot of downside, little upside this year. And Phil, definitely some hesitations with Xavier Worthy. I don't think we, we got into it, but Phil's been educating me. He's got me scared on Worthy. We'll, be careful. We'll, we'll talk about. Well, maybe maybe we'll do some short videos, and uh, yeah, we'll get into worthy. I yeah, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll have to. So I that's rounds four, five, and six. A little bit of takes, two to love, two to fade, and some takes in between. Hope you enjoyed. We're gonna have part three and four and five. And I don't have all the numbers. But we're gonna do lots of parts to this until we run this thing dry. Uh, please. Like, subscribe to both of our channels. Definitely like here, but if you haven't heard of Phil's The Extra Point, it's awesome. If you are newer to Dynasty, it is one of the best channels and I can recommend. Phil's a friend of mine. He's really walking you through, not just like Dynasty 101, but how to level up your game. If you're a sharp, but you're getting into Dynasty, some of the concepts, and then how to get a little bit of an edge, those tiny extra percentage points here and there to make you maybe win a game you wouldn't have otherwise won and to definitely enjoy the experience more. And I could listen to him talk literally all day and night. He has a fantastic voice. Uh, he won't say that, but I will. It's Thank awesome <laughs> hanging out and listening to you. So, so definitely, but Phil, I'm talking enough about you. Tell the fans where they can find you and why would they want to check out your channel? Yeah. Cheers, man. appreciate you having me on the show. Always a good time to be a guest here. Um, you can find me on Thursday nights on YouTube, the extra point. Uh, we go live every Thursday night at 7 PM Pacific, 10 PM Eastern. If you can't make the live show, not a big deal. I am on Patreon. I am also on Spotify. So like, and subscribe there. Um, we just basically record the content and make it a podcast. So if you, uh, don't get a chance to see the board, if we're going through, you know, roster construction or we're going to go through you know a, a build um, i'll do my very best to make sure that i am audibly making sure that you feel like you're able to see the board but yeah the extra point like you said kendall is really about finding a little bit of nuance and a little bit of differences those one to two percentage points that make the difference and where do we see some value that'll ultimately help you dominate your draft and, and win your league um, tomorrow night i will be live going through an auction recap and i know that is a space where not a lot of dynasty players are are playing i think a lot of dynasty content is still in the snake format uh if you're newer to auction definitely check that out uh if you've been through some auction it's like you know it's that's your that's your preferred format awesome that's mine too we're going to go through a lot of different values and where i see some ways that you can actually go ahead and 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 manage a budget and really put together a solid roster going forward so kendall man Thanks for having me, man. Always a good time to jump in here on the tavern and uh, appreciate it, buddy. Love it. Love it. Also in the description, check it out. Phil is a pretty good league runner. If not, we have an excellent community forming around us, uh, especially with the get right fantasy network crew. If you're looking to get into a dynasty league, if you're looking to get into any league, but you want to join it with people who are degenerates, we're, we're big fans of the sport. We're fun to be around. We like hanging out and talking fantasy. We're not just out to take your money. Look, everyone's out to win, and, and they should be. This is a competitive sport, right? If I play in a league with you, I want to beat you, but I want us to have a good time doing so. So when we have our drinks at the end of the day, it's a good time. If you are having trouble finding a league, and I know a lot of our listeners, not so having trouble, they could find a million leagues, but they want to be in leagues they want to be in, which I I could be in a lot more leagues too, but I want to be with people I enjoy hanging out with, greatly enjoy hanging out with. Message me, message Phil. We have a nice network of really great communities that are always adding leagues, adding more people. They need more people. We would love to set you up if we can. We're not at a point where we can't, uh, we can't message people back and help them out. While we're in that window, we would love to help you find a league that's right for you. And I know Phil's, that's his forte. He's very good at that. He's helped me connect with some, some great people as well. So check Phil's channel out. Check mine out. Come join uh, a league with us. We'll have a good time. And uh, catch us in the next one. We'll do a few more of these. We're going to be uh, our next series. I think that I'm going to do with Phil is going to be on some, uh, some dynasty and some redraft debates. Who we like, who we don't like. And we're going to fight it out. And uh, you be, get to be the judge who wins. Thanks for joining us. Again, like and subscribe. Small commitment of time. It means a ton to us, more than you can imagine. Please like, subscribe, check us out. Leave a comment. Let us know what you liked and disliked. And uh, we'll catch you the next time. Thanks so much.